speaker is our own Ron Cohen. And Ron started his career as an earth scientist um, at Indiana University and shifted uh, slightly um, to more theoretical earth sciences at Harvard, did his PhD there, and then made a big step into material science away from that and worked at the Naval Research Laboratory for a number of years um, before he was hired at the Geophysical Laboratory uh, at the time that Charlie Pruitt was director. This was probably, I'd say, three years before I came, something like that. 1990. Okay, five years before I came, 1995. So, so Ron joined us in 1990, probably at the old campus. No, no, just the first year here. First or year. Or second, or whatever it was. Yeah. yeah, well, that would have been 1990. So yeah, first right year. Right in the transition. Right. So you're a first staff member uh, to, to actually be here, probably, at the new facility, our so-called new facility. So without uh, any further ado, I can be Ron Cohen. Okay, thank you, and um, I'm glad to get a chance to talk about this. So if you've heard me talk about this topic before, uh, there will be some new stuff, but there's also some uh, old stuff too, because I find that, uh, you know, even though I've been working on this kind of nine stop since the 1980s, you know, not, not everybody is, you know, drinking and breathing the same problem necessarily that I am. So, uh, yeah, good. So anyway, so uh, I'm going to talk about strong coupling ferroelectrics, how they work, and how they can be improved. And, and this will also give you some ideas of what some of the uh, uh, postdocs are working on here that are working with me. And uh, of course, I'm here. Uh, this is my home institution at Carnegie. I'm also uh, half-time in uh, Munich under a uh, European Research Council uh, advance grant uh, called Theory of Mantle Core and Technological Materials which covers like everything that I do. So I still do earth science too, see mantle and core, but I'm gonna talk about uh, technological materials today at ferroelectrics. And um, so without further ado, I will get going. Let's see, ah, no. So I'm gonna talk about really two topics. The first one is kind of the, something that I've worked on for a long time. And uh, there's bits of it in, in the second part I'll talk about as well, the importance of polarization rotation. And the second thing is the importance of polar defects and, uh, in ferroelectrics. And this is something that I think uh, uh, was kind of a, um, a topic that uh, was kind of like a, a, bit, a bit of a backwater uh, area. And I'm finding that it's just exploding now. So it's taken me so long to get anywhere on this topic that I'm already playing catch up, as opposed to, even though we were talking about it for many years. Now, ferroelectrics are incredibly useful materials, and I, I think I showed this slide uh, some years ago here, but hopefully every, nobody remembers. Or if you do, fine. I mean, Star Trek is here, but it's not only here, it's been here for many years now. I mean, we now have handheld uh, medical devices that can be uh, used anywhere, uh, run on batteries, whatever, that that can look inside a person and see almost anything. I mean, this is a heart valve uh, uh, in real time uh, that's defective. This is a real fetus in 3D. And so these things are all seen with sound waves. And so with, with sound, you can make high resolution images inside the body now and, uh, and just you know, completely non-invasively. And a lot of things are moving in that direction. You know, instead of exploratory surgery now, you know, people can just look inside and see see what's going on. And people are developing better and better uh, 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 acoustic uh, probes, partly because we're developing better and better materials that give us much higher acoustic resolution. Also, uh, you can now generate energy. Uh, this thing costs about a dollar, and it has an, uh, produces enough energy from just uh, wind to uh, drive, say, a street lamp or something like that. And so these things are appearing in the developing world, and you know they should be all over the place. Uh, you can generate uh, energy now from just the vibrations of cars and trucks moving over bridges or, the, uh, uh, or people walking over uh, uh, through uh, uh, subway uh, turnstiles. And this is being implemented and done all, all over the world. Um, another really exciting area, which is going to make a big difference as time goes on, uh, though it hasn't, I think, it's still not uh, FDA approved in the U.S., but uh, it's acoustic surgery. And so you can now, even without cutting into a person at all, you can concentrate enough uh, sound energy to, to destroy a tumor. And the only issue with it is that you have to do pretty good modeling so that you make sure that you, and it has to be done on an individual basis because there's no, you know, humans are not all identical. So, 
So you have to figure out for each person exactly how you're going to concentrate the energy in the right place and uh, what temperature you're going to raise the cells to in order to kill them. And, and of course, there's a lot of work done on animals, but it's even used on, on people now in some places in the world. Uh, you can now make an uh, uh, X-ray generator that's this big, okay, um, and uh, runs on a standard 9-volt battery, produces hard X-rays. Uh, uh, it says 2003 winter. You can see how old this slide is. I mean, so this isn't even new. I mean, this is something that's been around. It's on satellites. You know, people take this for granted. Here's a mouse uh, X-ray made with this thing. And, uh, and it's just uh, really simple. It's just caused by changing the temperature of a, of a piezoelectric. And, and that generates enough of electric field to accelerate ions in a gas to, to, against the target to make hard x-rays. And not only that, you can even generate neutrons. So, uh, so if you put this uh, lithium niobate into heavy water and change the temperature by a few degrees, then uh, you start generating ready neutrons from fusion of the, of the uh, deuterons in, in the heavy water. This is x-rays being generated and you'll see uh, neutrons being generated over here. This was published years and years ago uh, by Seth Hutterman at UCLA and still, you know, it just takes so long for anything to actually make the marketplace. You know, nobody is uh, really doing anything with this. Uh, it's been reproduced by several people. It, it was originally published in Nature and then later in PRL people reproduced it. So it's a real effect, and yet, you know, people haven't figured out how to really bring it to the market. I think that, you know, scientists generally are interested in the science and not necessarily in, in you know, applying it to something. Okay, so I'm going to talk about theoretical studies of these systems. And these are, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today are all really uh, 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 mainstream standard model kinds of calculations, but hopefully applied a little bit creatively, I hope. Uh, we're using density functional theory, or DFT, and I'm not going to go over the details of exactly what we're doing. And we also have a small experimental program running here now at, at, at the Geophysical Lab. Uh, and those of you who know Raja, uh, looking at, and also Mukhtar, of course, look, and, and his uh, work has been, uh, I'll talk more about later. Uh, actually, I'll talk about their work, both of their works later. And uh, doing a variety of high pressure Rama and X ray second harmonic generation. and and some real ones scattering on, on, the, on these systems. So uh, what we're really interested in eventually is really being able to predict properties of materials on the computer and then tell people exactly how to make them and hopefully have the properties that people want. Uh, and we also want to really understand the, the, the details of what's going on. These are exquisitely sensitive materials. So, so uh, you know, sometimes when people give a talk like this, they pass around a little thing or something that'll give you an electric shock or something when you squeeze it, you know. I mean, a tiny little change in stress or, or electric field can cause, you know, huge changes in the properties of these materials. And, 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 uh, and they're used, like I said, for everything. Sonar, you know, I talked about the medical applications. Uh, they're used as sensors in, 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 in places like, uh, one of the latest uh, things is that, uh, you know, when you do wind energy, the, the biggest expense actually is inspecting the turbine blades on the windmill. And so that has to be done periodically, and that's expensive. You have to shut the thing down. Someone has to climb up there and look at it with a microscope. Well, they figured out that you can inspect them with sound waves, so the sound can detect a crack in the turbine blade. And then you can permanently mount the piezoelectric on the blade, and then just the energy of the vibration of the blade is enough to generate enough energy to run the sensor. So everything is completely, so it increases the efficiency of, of a wind turbine by, you know, a huge factor. So there's, you know, applications everywhere of these things. So uh, I started working on this in, in the 1980s, just basically trying to understand how ferroelectrics worked at all. Are and you, Ron, yes. are you going to define what a ferroelectric yeah, is? Yeah, I will. I will. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I can do it right now because you asked, okay? So, so a ferroelectric has an electric polarization, which means like a dipole moment, basically, that can be switched, okay? So you can apply an electric field and you can switch the dipole moment up or down. And um, a piezoelectric is something that strains, so it changes shape or size when you apply an electric field. So, uh, so if you make a transducer, basically you need to convert uh, uh, 
uh, electrical energy into uh, mechanical energy or vice versa. And uh, so that's uh, the way you do it is with the piezoelectric. So, uh, so a lot of the best known ferroelectrics are perovskites, and uh, such as lead titanate or barium titanate. These are the classic uh, uh, ferroelectric perovskites. And then nowadays people make all kinds of complicated fer uh, perovskites uh, that I'll talk more about later, but they're still just perovskites. So they're, if you're familiar with the perovskite structure, th that's all they are. There are per uh, ferroelectrics of many other different structures, and, uh, and some of them are actually used commonly. Um, but, uh, and, some, and sometimes the word ferroelectric is used in a sense that's uh, uh, a little loose. So, uh, so sometimes uh, it's pretty hard to switch the polarization, but since it, in principle, could be switched, we still call it a ferroelectric. So, um, and sometimes it really can't be switched at all, but we still just lump it in, you know. So it's a kind of a, a sloppy terminology. But basically, they're all piezoelectric, certainly, and they're all polar. So they all have a dipole moment, and that's what brings all of these things together. They're all active materials in the sense that they do something when you uh, try to interact with them with an applied field. So all of them underneath have an energy uh, multiple well surface that looks something like this, and these double wells are actually how I got started. Is you know people had talked about these multiple well systems for for decades. And, uh, but nobody actually had seen one because that's not something you can actually measure in the lab. And that's one of the reasons that theory is an interesting thing. You know, everybody wonders why bother doing theory, just do experiments. Well, here's a, maybe a primary example of why we want to do theory. So when you do an experiment, you measure something like a vibrational frequency, so like how rapidly this moves back and forth down here. Or you measure like a phase transition temperature, which is maybe the temperature at which you start averaging over these multiple wells so that it looks like there aren't multiple wells and then at some low temperature it gets stuck in one side or the other. So those are things you can measure in a straightforward way in a lab. But the thing you can't do in the lab is actually find out what this fundamental potential surface is because there's no energy meter. You know, well, you can do calorimetry, but, but that just gives you an average over, you know, the changes in the system. It doesn't tell you an absolute you know, mapping of this system. So with theory, we can actually map these things out and see what's going on un kind of underneath the hood. And then we can hope to tweak things by changing the chemistry or the pressure or the strain and, and make things better. I mean, that's the basic idea. Uh, Slater in the 1950s said that these systems were so simple that we would shortly soon completely understand them. So you know, many tens of thousands of publications later, you know, I would say, we just discover more and more new things instead of completely understanding them. Oh, and I should say that the, that the important thing in these systems that makes them work is that, is that you have a very sensitive interplay between covalency, like bonding between oxygens and, and the B-side atom, in this case the titanium, and, uh, and uh, short-range repulsion forces that try to push atoms apart. So actually, uh, these atoms actually move closer together in the ferroelectric state but then it could be it's symmetrical, so they, this side could be closer or the other side could be closer. So at high temperature, it can bounce back and forth between the two. At low temperature, it gets frozen in on one side. And uh, the most commonly used piezoelectric material, which you can find everywhere, it's in your watch, it's in your seatbelt alarm, it's in uh, most sonar devices and submarines, whatever, uh, is lead uh, zircon zirconium titanate, PZT, and this is a really cheap thing, easy to make, uh, but it's an immensely complicated, and it's really theorists, uh, this is Andy Rapp's group some years ago, uh, that did detailed atomistic studies of this system, uh, and uh, uh, the group that both Hiro and, and, and Chi, Chi Lu are, are, are from, and uh, by the way, and um, so, uh, and mapping out exactly how things change, the phase diagram as a function of composition has been a matter of, you know, of great uh, interest to both theorists and experimentalists. But the real uh, revolution happened uh, uh, some years ago now, uh, which is uh, the so-called single crystal piezoelectrics, which are not ceramics, and, they're, and they, they have uh, uh, efficiencies of over 90% of coupling of electrical and mechanical energy, as opposed to like 50% uh, or 40 to 50% for something like PZT. 
And this is uh, something that's, that uh, they, they now grow these in these bulls that are like four inches or even bigger in diameter, and, and they're really long. And it's an amazing feat of, uh, you know, of crystal growth because these things are, are grown. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a solid solution, so if you just precipitate from the melt, you'll get you know, a composition gradient as you go. And so they have to continually change the composition of the melt in order to have a uniform uh, product out. And then they slice these things, and these are actually the things that are used in, 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 in up-to-date, uh, uh, this is from Philips actually, uh, you know, the most modern uh, uh, medical equipment and so forth. Let's see. Ah, and this is really the key uh, understanding of how these uh, single crystal piezoelectrics work, and it actually gives you insight into really all of the materials. So this was kind of the picture uh, before uh, we got started on it. Uh, what is, uh, you know, everybody likes to think of things in a one-dimensional space. And so you think of, uh, you know, especially engineers, pardon any engineers here, but, you know, but that's, you know, it's always easier to work in one dimension than in multiple dimensions. So you usually think of applying electric field. And in fact, for technical reasons, you know, in an experiment, it's, this is, as Roger can explain to you, this is the easy measurement to make, you know. So, you know, if you think about putting electrodes on a, on a, on a disk, you know, you put electrodes on the face of the disk, you don't put them on the edge of the disk, you know, it's kind of hard. So, so this is the easy measurement to make, and you have an electric field, and so here's, I was going to explain piezoelectricity and ferroelectricity here. So, well, maybe ferro, it's not explained so much here, but, but, but this is the strain part, the piezo part, so you see the thing changing shape as a function of the electric field, and what's happening is the dipole moment, the polarization is changing in response to the applied field. Now the ferroelectric part would be that you apply the field in the opposite direction and you switch the direction here. Okay, that's the only bit that's different. Actually, um, it depends on the application that you're going to use the material for, whether you need the piezoelectric effect or the ferroelectric effect or whatever. So, for example, your smart card that you use on the metro I hope this is still true, it used to be true, that it actually has a ferroelectric memory in it. So, uh, so the way it stores in it, you know, how much money you have is with a ferroelectric memory. So it remembers, so there's little pixels in there that are up or down, which are the polarization uh, pointing up or down in the material, and, and then it can be read electronically. So it's not a magnetic thing, so your smart card will not get demagnetized because it's ferroelectric. But don't get it too hot, you know, I don't know. It probably the plastic melts before you destroy the ferroelectric. But anyway, so so uh, so they so probably it's a stable. I haven't heard of anybody saying their smart card doesn't work anymore. So they seem to be pretty uh, stable. And then, uh, but what we showed is that you get a much larger response. And this is what's going on in the single crystal uh, piezoelectrics if you rotate the polarization rather than having this collinear effect. And it. it and, and it maybe t is worth spending a minute on this. It seems so trivial, and I've shown this years ago here, uh, but, uh, but it's really important and, and still uh, requires some thinking in real applications of how, this, uh, how to use this and how it works. So if you, if you look at these uh, materials like uh, barium titanate or the new uh, single crystal piezoelectric, they tend to have a rhombohedral ground state where the polarization is pointing along the cube diagonal direction here. And it has a very small strain. It's almost like a cube. And when you apply an electric field oblique to the polarization then, it rotates up towards this other direction and you acquire a very large strain. It's almost like an electric field driven phase transition. And uh, so, so the strain in this case can be like uh, uh, up to 2% or more, for example, as you apply a reasonable electric field, whereas the strain in this case would be you know, a few hundredths of a percent or something like that. So it's like a factor of 10 maybe increasing the amount of strain you can get for a given electric field. And so this kind of configuration is the way to think of, 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 of optimizing uh, properties. So, so, uh, so that's well and good. Well, I don't know if you remember uh, Michael Wu, Zhigang Wu was a postdoc here some years ago. He's now at Colorado School of Mines. Uh, but he uh, did this work with me on lead titanate. So lead titanate is that material that Slater said, you know, kind of father of electronic structure uh, from the 1950s at MIT, said that, uh, we have completely understood. And, uh, and this shows why it's good to be at the geophysical lab, because 
he was doing uh, calculations on, on uh, properties of different ferroelectrics. And he said, well, here I am at the geophysical lab where they do high pressure research. So I should calculate the high pressure properties of lead titanate. So I mean, OK, fine, you know, who knows? You know? I mean, it, you wouldn't think that you're actually going to use it at high pressure. So maybe people wouldn't think to do that. But what he found was that you went up in pressure in the calculations. It went through a series of phase transitions. And the piezoelectric constants became larger. Uh, that means the coupling between the mechanical and the electrical uh, ca uh, characteristics became larger than for any known material under pressure. So that was really exciting, and uh, we published this prediction, and uh, it was just a prediction. So uh, we published it in PRL, and then the question was, you know, can it be seen experimentally? So Mukhtar here uh, did some work on this and found exactly what uh, had been predicted in the, um, in the uh, theory, uh, and then discovered a lot more as well. So, so the conventional view was that if you go up in pressure in a ferroelectric, everything becomes non-ferroelectric. That was the old idea. And this goes back to, uh, actually it's on another slide. Th this goes back to, uh, uh, for example, this work from 1983 where, uh, where uh, Burns' group did uh, Raman as a function of pressure at room temperature in uh, lead titanate. And he sees these uh, soft modes go to zero, and at that point, the, it becomes cubic, and so it looked like the ferroelectricity goes away at like uh, 12 GPA or something like that. So, so that was the conventional view. But, uh, but, and that's indeed what we see in the experiments as you look at the Raman, as you go up in pressure at like 12 GPA, there's not much Raman anymore. So, uh, so this is kind of second order Raman or whatever, but the big peaks go away under pressure. But the theory had said that under pressure it should remain ferroelectric and have this huge electromechanical response. So this is what happens, but the theory was done at zero temperature. So, so Mukhtar did the, these cryogenic experiments. This is at 20 Kelvin. And you see that as you go up here, it's 22 GPA. It's still strong Raman spectra even at that, those conditions. So it doesn't become cubic at low temperature with increasing pressure. And in fact, what happens Instead, is that there's this, uh, something that looks like this so-called morphotrophic phase boundary, where the system becomes monoclinic in between a, a tetragonal and a rhombohedral rate, uh, range, which is the same thing that's happening in the relaxer ferroelectrics and in PZT, which gives you the huge electromechanical response. So you see the same thing in pure lead titanate under pressure. And that gives us an idea, and actually this feeds into the sort of work, for example, that Tim Strobel's doing here, this shows you that basically what's happening in PZT and PMP, PMNPT and all of these exotic uh, uh, high coupling materials is basically you're taking like lead titanate and you're taking this transition that occurs at maybe 15 GPA and you're chemically tuning it down to zero pressure so that you can use it, you know, in a zero pressure, which most of us live, you know, uh, application. And so now that we understand that, we can use the idea of chemical tuning to find new materials and optimize their properties. So in fact, this is an example of it. And this is one of the things that's never been done in the lab yet. So one reason that we started this small experimental program here is to do some stuff that we predicted but hadn't been able to convince anybody to do yet. Oh, it's done already. But this is, uh, this is um, maybe I can show this again. This is. Uh, uh, lead tin titanate, which hasn't been made yet, but, but based on this idea of pressure tuning, we, we, we uh, came up with this material, which we predicted to have huge uh, electromechanical coupling, higher than other materials. And if somebody could make it, say in film, thin film form, maybe we can use it to make better you know, artificial insects that can fly around and spy on people. Well, I, I don't know that it's such a good result. But anyway, so, so, uh, <laughs> so that's the kind of thing that these things can be used for. So, uh, so that's all where we stand now. So where, where, where can we improve things? You know, to some people now, uh, like our, our funders, you know, for example, at the Office of Naval Research, you know, it's about as good as it can get. So, you know, they're, they're very proud of us, and they say, you, you've done a great job, you know, uh, there's nothing else for you to do, you know, so go do something else, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and uh, go find some money somewhere else. So, so, uh, so they haven't actually said that yet because we say, wait, wait, we can improve things better. Okay, so, uh, so they say, how can you improve things better? Because it's about as good as it can get. 
Okay, so we have right now a situation where we have these single crystal piezoelectrics that have efficiencies of up to 95, 96 percent in some cases. You know, we're going to argue that, you know, give us tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars and we can make it 97 percent. You know, it's really not something that's going to get people really excited. So, uh, uh, or we can say we can understand the existing materials better. Okay, that's fine, but you know, but what are we going to do with it? Well, one thing that I'm really not going to talk about today, but except for this one uh, statement, I'll say, is that there is one issue, is that all of these contain lead. And the, the crazy bureaucrats in Europe, for example, have made a law that, that you're not allowed to use lead in anything after a certain year. And they keep pushing the year off. But the last thing I heard is that they said that we're not going to push it anymore. So I don't know, it's like in two years or something. But meanwhile, everything we use in ferroelectrics and real applications is a lead material, PZT, and PMNPT. So there are all these people out there trying to find materials that are lead-free that have just as good uh, behavior. But you know, to tell you the truth, I mean, you know, you're very unlikely to get lead poisoning from swallowing your watch, you know, I mean, or, or from you know, swallowing the fuel injector in your car, you know, which has, uh, you know, which is also a, PZT type material, or swallowing a, or, uh, you know, a, uh, a, uh, a medical transducer. You know, you're probably going to have other problems other than the lead poisoning. But, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and, and they're not volatile. You know, but and 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 they're made, you know, in kind of a laboratory environment. I mean, it's not like a steel mill or something like that. So, I mean, you're able to deal with the lead during the manufacturing process as well. But still, this is the law, and so they want to get rid of lead and everything. And so that's one driving thing for some people, particularly in certain countries, for finding new materials. Uh, the other thing is, is cost. So, so it turns out that if you look at a typical transducer, like high performance modern transducer, most of the cost is actually in the crystal now, in the material. And they hate that, you know, I mean, they want most of the cost to be, you know, profit, you know, or whatever, you know, or, you know, software or something that, you know, you can you can just copy, you know, that you don't have to go make or something like that. So, so, uh, so the PZT is really cheap material, but these PMNPT crystals and so forth are, are really exotic, ex you know, expensive things, and it's an art form to grow them, so only a few small companies can make them, and they have, you know, the whole world market, basically, you know. So, uh, so it would be nice to have materials that uh, are cheap and just as good as the as the um, expensive one. So that's kind of what we're working on right now. So, oh, so one route to this kind of enhanced performance is from defect dipoles. And so that I'll be explaining what that means. So that's what we've been working on lately. So, um, so this is actually a paper from 1972. And we didn't even discover this until fairly recently. I think it was Mukhtar that found this paper. But anyway, so the things we've been talking about have been kicking around for a long time. But, but, uh, but uh, you know, it hasn't gone anywhere. Maybe now it's starting to pick up. In fact, I, I did a, a few years ago, maybe three years ago, I did a literature search on this just to make sure I hadn't missed anything. And I found like one or two papers in the last few years or something before that. So I felt comfortable that we were, you know, we could take our normal slow time at doing things, you know. and. and uh, and uh, so before I gave a talk on this in Japan uh, a few months ago, I, uh, I did another search. And I found like 3,000 papers from the last year, you know, almost all of them Chinese, you know. So, so, so there's a tremendous amount of work going on in this now. People are starting to understand there's something big here. Anyway, what, what, what was done in this paper was to just show that you take a typical material. So this is actually a, a typical hysteresis loop for ferroelectric. And so you have the polarization, which is like the dipole moment in the electric field. So you apply an electric field in the plus direction here. It switches the polarization up to plus, And then you reverse the, the electric field. And there's some hysteresis. But finally, it switches to down. So this is this switching process in a conventional ferroelectric. But what he found is that if he took just an ordinary material like barium titanate, and he let it sit around a long time, like a few days at 80 degrees C or something like that, you know, in the glove compartment of your car or something like that. It started looking like this instead of like this, you know. So he published this paper, and uh, and he said, uh, um, um, that uh, he called it aging. Okay, so uh, so uh, 
Anyway, so this sat around in the literature and people didn't know so much what to do with it until this paper by Wren, uh, and this was published a while ago, this is in 2004, and what he showed is that, uh, again, using this aging effect, he could get very unusual, uh, uh, this double hysteresis loop like this, and also the strain became enormous. So this is in a normal material barium titanate, and, uh, and when this aging process went, uh, the strain became much larger. And I've written this as barium titanate with some manganese uh, defects. He actually, uh, they did some samples with manganese added, but they also just took samples that they hadn't tried to do any high purity anything on. So they were just kind of off the shelf samples and saw the same kind of behavior and decided it was just like iron impurities or something like that was causing the same effect. So it seems like a very small amount of impurities can give this huge change in behavior. And what he, decided, what he proposed was the mechanism for this is that there were defect dipoles in the material which uh, uh, are, uh, during this aging process, all line up with each other. And I'll explain what defect dipoles are in, in a minute. But they basically are little dipoles, so they're plus and minus you know, next to each other. And uh, they line up with each other over time. And then when you apply an electric field in the, in the perpendicular direction, you can rotate the pol see the polarization rotation again from up to, to, to the right. And then when you take the field off, it can go back again. So you get this reversible switching behavior, just like the polarization rotation that you see in lead titanate under pressure, or that you see in PMNPT, or that you see in uh, PZT in the morphotropic phase boundary region. And, and yet this is in a conventional material, a plastic material that shouldn't have this effect, but it's because of these defects all lining up with each other. So that was his model. And uh, he did, he did uh, uh, different work on it, uh, I, uh, a few, a few uh, papers. Uh, and then uh, people, like I said, recently have started to pick up on this. And so this is uh, recent work from 2015. Uh, showing this kind of effect in different materials with different amounts of doping and different amounts of aging. This is 70 degrees C for eight days and so forth, trying to make sense of, uh, 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 of, what, of the process. So some people kind of feel like this is maybe even understood, but really I think, I think there is some more understanding to, to come into it. This is kind of the overall idea of what's happening. This is just a schematic that I drew, but basically when you apply in a field along the X direction, the polarization is rotating from Z to X, and finally it switches to PX, to the X direction, and then you lower the field and it goes back, there is a storing force to go back the other way. And so that gives you this double loop effect here. And um, if you, you have to think about it a few minutes before you see why that gives a double loop. But um, so, so, uh, so can we use that? I mean, now, people have known about this for years, and, uh, and uh, it's always just been a problem. So why has it been a problem? It's because it just makes your samples non-reproducible. So you get something from, you know, from, the, from the lab, from the manufacturer, and it's supposed to have certain properties, and you're going to stick it into your transducer or something and use it uh, in, in, you know, into the rest of your equipment. But, uh, but the problem is, is you let it get a little hot or the sample sits around for a certain amount of time and, you know, at reasonably high temperatures, you know, I mean, not that high, but just a little bit high. And then it starts behaving differently than it did before. So that's bad, right? Because, you know, if you're an engineer, you want reproducibility. You don't want, you know, even if something gets better, I mean, that doesn't matter. I mean, it, you know, unless you can actually reproducibly make it better. So that's the problem is that since we're dealing with defects, and their aging and their uh, orientation and so forth, we need some way to control it and to understand it and be able to make it reproducible. So we need to understand that fundamentally then, this is a slide from Ivan Nelmov, who worked on this uh, problem with me some years ago also. Uh, so so uh, we need to understand in some fundamental way the effect of dopants. And, and, and dopants are very interesting, by the way, because if you buy one of these uh, commercial samples, like from a company that's sells so-called engineered materials, okay? What an engineered material means is they've put some stuff in it that they're not going to tell you what it is, and it makes it have better properties than their competitor's material. So this is a, a marketing thing, and so they give it their own name. You know, they call it, you know, PZT, you know, whatever, they give it a number or something, you know, 513, who knows, you know. And uh, so that material then, 
uh, they'll, they'll mark it and sell, and it'll have some witch's brew of different stuff added to it, and they won't even tell us, you know, so if we get a sample from one of these companies, you know, we could do our own analysis, but it's hard to measure things on the trace scale that they're putting in. So basically, they just dump stuff in. So I've taken some of these people aside, and I've said, well, how much manganese are you adding? And they'd say, oh, a few percent. So I say, so is it a certain amount? So it turns out, from what I've gathered, is it doesn't matter. Okay, so when they say a few percent, I mean, that's how exact they are. They have a big vat, you know, of material, and they throw in a handful of manganese, you know. So I said, well, what do you mean you throw in manganese? Is it manganese oxide? Is it MN203? Is it manganese metal? You know, what is it? And they said, I don't know. It just says manganese, you know, on the bottle. <laughs> so, uh, so we're trying to turn this into a science and understand what's really going on. And, and there's a lot of, you know, secrecy in this uh, field, so, so it's something you have to work with as well. Uh, oh, one of the issues with this is that there's both extrinsic and e intrinsic effects from adding uh, dopant. So, for example, uh, all of these materials have domains and domain walls, and, uh, and they move around, and that can eat up energy if you're moving domains. And in fact, you can read in Nature a few weeks ago, uh, Shi Lu had a very nice uh, uh, paper, Nature, from his thesis work on, um, on uh, domain walls and how they move in ferroelectrics. So there's a lot of interest still in, in basic things about domain walls, but one of the things is when you add something like manganese or other dopants, uh, dopants to these material, it can pin the domain walls and keep them from moving, and so that can make the, the material more, more uh, uh, stable. For example, there's a, uh, a parameter probably everybody here is familiar with, which is the mechanical Q, and you know uh, if Q is high, you know it's a good resonator, and if it's low, you know it eats up, it's a lot of attenuation, you know it eats up a lot of energy. So it turns out the mechanical Q in these materials can vary by many orders of magnitude, and it depends on these trace materials and so forth, what, what that Q is. And that's one of the things that the manufacturers will tell you, that their material has a Q of whatever. And depending on the application, you may want a big Q or you may want a low Q. Oh, so this is work of Ivan and also uh, uh, Javier Nosa, remember him, uh, with postdoc here and looking at what happens if you put manganese and associated oxygen defects. So here's where your polar defect comes in. So you have two defects. So you have a manganese going onto a titanium site and then a missing oxygen right next to it. And so they found in the studies they were trying to understand exactly what the local uh, atomic uh, uh, configuration is when you put in these kind of coupled defects. And you see it generates a net dipole because you've replaced a 4 plus titanium with a 2 plus manganese and then a two minus oxygen with a nothing. And so that's a huge little dipole that you've stuck in your material. And so the thing is, is that if you move these oxygen vacancies around, which means you're moving oxygens, but you know, and you line them up, then you can have something that has quite a large uh, 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 bias built into the material itself. And so that's what we're trying to understand now on a microscopic level. And we did some early work trying to understand uh, uh, in, in large uh, DFT calculations how things behaved as a function of electric field, and it was very complicated. I mean, you know, we understood why people are seeing weird stuff, because we were just seeing weird stuff, and it took a while for us to finally settle down and figure out what's going on, which I would say is only kind of like in the last few weeks. So, uh, so that's what I'll be talking about the rest of the time. Uh, this is really ongoing work that, uh, that uh, is not uh, settled, so everything I say from now on is really preliminary but, uh, and unpublished, but, um, but I, think that, uh, I think it's basically right. And so, uh, so one of the things, uh, this is a uh, uh, postdoc here, Hiro uh, Takanaka, so he's uh, been doing calculations on this problem, uh, so one of the things uh, we've done is to do large-scale calculations for barium titanate with and without this manganese vacancy uh, defect pair, and then look at the polarization versus electric field uh, behavior, and you see there's a difference when you have the manganese uh, oxygen vacancy and when it's not there. And from this difference, we can extract what the effect of electric field is in the material, and it turns out it's about 18 megavolts per meter, which is a pretty big field, by the way for 12.5% manganese, which is a pretty large amount of manganese, okay? But we, we can scale this number, so if you put in like a few percent manganese, this number will be, well, let's say you put in 1.2% manganese, then, oh, here it says, 
2 megavolts per meter for 1% manganese. Okay, so this is an appreciable electric field. I mean, it's not something that just happens. It's something you need to apply with a you know, high voltage generator to your material. And, uh, and, um, and it's for a fairly small amount of manganese. So like some of the engineered samples I was talking about, they said they maybe have 5% manganese. But we don't know that 5%, by the way, is all in the crystal or if they have some, like, uh, well, some of it's probably at the domain boundaries and instead of in the bulk, and then some of it may be in other phases. So, you know, so this is another reason we need, you know, to do fundamental work on this because we don't know the situation in these uh, engineered samples. But here, we can control everything on the computer and we can see exactly what's going on. And uh, so, so the, we get this fairly large electric field from just a fairly small percentage of defects. Uh, this is doing the same calculation in a different way, and it came up with a very similar number. So, um, so these are so so in the natural bulk material, you have the titanium and the oxygen, and then in this doped material, you have the manganese replacing the titanium with the vacancy next door. So, uh, so we've got so I showed you a few minutes ago this early work we did where we really weren't able to make sense of what was going on in the calculations. And they're fairly slow calculations. I mean, these things take many hours on a supercomputer. Uh, so, so, uh, so for these uh, large cells with the, with the vacancies and so forth. And so to figure out what's going on takes a lot of time. So it's a lot easier if you have a simple model that you can basically run you know, in, in no time at all, just instantly on your phone or laptop or whatever. So that's what uh, Hero's been working on. And uh, for example, you can develop just a Taylor expansion in the free energy versus the polarization and then fit those parameters, all these different little A's in here are parameters that you fit then uh, to first principles calculation. So he's done that and developed a model uh, and, um, and uh, don't read everything on the slide, some of it I have some problems with. But anyway, uh, so we're working on it, like I said, right now. But uh, so, uh, and then using this model, we can apply it to, to uh, 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 the real materials as a function of doping. Now on a, a parallel track, uh, Shi Lu has, uh, you know, we've basically decided to just, you know, like take the cavalry approach, you know, and just like instead of just using one method and, you know, we're really like trying a lot of different things all at the same time. So Shi Lu has a different model that he's been applying, which is a, a, also a first principles based model, but it's a so-called bond valence force field model. I actually have a slide maybe? Yeah, I do. Okay. And I'll show it in a second. And, uh, and, and putting in kind of generic dipoles into the model, and then he's able to do very, very large scale simulations, and you can actually look at things like local electric fields from defect dipoles. And when I showed this at an electron microscopy meeting, people got very excited because because this is something in potential that can actually be seen in high resolution electron microscopy. So, uh, so I think people are trying to look for this now. Anyway, um, so, uh, so I'm going to show you what kind of results have come out of that. This is really a very quite simple model that uh, he perfected in his thesis work and has applied to different systems including, well I think I'll have a slide on it, including the new uh, 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 so-called hybrid uh, uh, perovskites, which are uh, kind of the latest uh, uh, exciting area in photovoltaics, which are different than ferroelectrics, but still it's a perovskite. So, um, so using this, uh, he's been doing these large-scale simulations, and for example, this is in an undoped sample. So here's the normal hysteresis loop, where you see the electric field on the x-axis and the polarization on the y-axis in something like barium titanate, a model of barium titanate, and this is the strain shown here, which is pretty small in barium titanate, and so we showed it on the same scale as this figure here so that you could easily see the difference. So what's here is with 2% defects, and so you see the double hysteresis loop, and you see the enormous increase in strain. Now we could do this in a reproducible way in a ceramic material, and we have a material that's as good as the single crystal piezoelectrics, but cost pennies instead of hundreds of thousands of dollars each. So, so, uh, so this is you know, our selling point and what we're doing here. So it's really learning how to understand this and control it. So this shows uh, an example from uh, Shi Lu of his molecular dynamics simulations, uh, kind of in a way that you can really easily visualize what's going on. 
and you, you see that if you turn on an electric field and then you turn it off again, things go back. So you have this recoverable behavior from these def defect dipoles. If you don't have the defect dipoles, then what happens is you turn on the electric field, you get this huge effect, and that's a one-shot deal. So then you never get it again. You know? so, uh, so here you have an effect that's reproducible, and that's the whole thing. So I mentioned we have an experimental program. I, I, I just very quickly uh, mentioned some of the things that are being done to try to see this in the lab. And this is uh, work that uh, Roger's been doing. This is at NRL. Uh, he's been co collaborating, collaborating there with, uh, with, um, with uh, Peter Finkel's group. And uh, uh, we don't have all this equipment here at Carnegie, so, uh, so, uh, so that's why we're doing that. And uh, so he's done measurements on, uh, this is one of the latest uh, engineered materials, PIN, PMN, PT, okay? So it's lead indium niobate, lead mag magnesium niobate, lead titanate, so it's a ternary solid solution, plus manganese added, okay? So why would anybody have such a thing? Well, this is the kind of thing that they're marketing, except that we have a good relationship with these people and they'll actually tell us what they're doing and give us samples, so that's nice, okay? And so he's been doing measurements on these materials. The problem is, is that it turns out that, uh, that um, uh, because of the uh, nature of, these are single crystals, which is a little harder to deal with because you have to know exactly what the orientation of your sample is. And uh, just very briefly, we have to kind of post-process the data to see these double hysteresis loops, uh, and, and kind of artificially rotating the sample because it seems like it wasn't in the, in the orientation that we thought it was. But we do see the kind of effects that we expected to see in this material uh, under, um, you know, from the, uh, but we also see it in the, uh, it, I think we, we also see it in the undoped samples. So uh, the problem is, as Ben Burton here from NIST could explain, is that even if you don't dope your sample, you can have intrinsic defects from like lead oxygen vacancies, which have similar behaviors. So we're trying, and, and you know, we're trying to understand aging. And the problem is, is you know, aging can happen, you know, automatically, right? You get a sample from someone, and who knows what its condition is, or how they annealed it, or whatever. So it's not like it came right out of the oven or something. So, you know, to try to understand whether something's aged or unaged or doped or undoped is a little bit difficult, especially since we're dealing with things on such micro amounts. So I mentioned this, this uh, model that, uh, that uh, Hero's been working on. And so we, these are kind of preliminary results, but this is a stereographic diagram showing the uh, direction of the polarization as a function of, uh, uh, of applying an electric field with different amounts of manganese. And so I don't want to go over this in detail, but this is the kind of thing that we're trying to model now from theory by using these kind of models. And, and so we have, hopefully, the ability eventually of you know, closing the circle between the experiments and the simulations uh, and really understanding uh, what's going on. Um, I mentioned uh, this work uh, by Shi Lu. Actually, this paper was just uh, uh, accepted for publication. But, uh, you know, we decided to see what happens in, in one of these uh, photovoltaic materials if you apply an electric field, uh, you know, because they were being used, you know, pe being studied for photovoltaic properties. It turns out that even though these look like they should be enormously complicated materials, they have, they have uh, iodine uh, and lead here, and then this organic molecule, uh, me methyl ammonium in, in the A site of the uh, perovskite. And so you'd think that, oh, well, that's enormously complicated. But it turns out you can grow this beautiful crystals of this stuff at room temperature, and it's so much easier to work with than the complicated oxide ferroelectric. So we thought, well, what maybe there's actually applications you can apply this to. So we, we did some work, or, or Shilu did some work applying electric field, and then looking at things like the electrocaloric effect, which I don't really have time to talk about today, but it's, a, a, it's another application of ferroelectrics because it gives you solid state cooling. And so it has great potential for cooling like uh, uh, CPU chips or in computers or whatever, or maybe eventually cooling your beer uh, in a very energy efficient way. Now, uh, and um, so, so, uh, so you get a change in temperature as a function of electric field, which can be put into a refrigeration cycle kind of loop. 
And so we wanted to see if these uh, easy to make materials would have good properties for that. So you can see the change in temperature as he applies the field, and indeed we get you know, an appreciable effect. But even more interesting was that uh, he found a very large piezo calorector, calor caloric effect. So that if you strain the material, and they're very soft, so they're very easy to strain. So with a very small amount of energy, you can strain the material and get quite a large change in temperature. So here's the thing where you squeeze it you know, with your fingers, and it, it will get cold in your hands. You know? so, uh, so that's kind of interesting. So, Anyway, this paper was accepted. It, it hasn't been studied in the lab yet. These are just from computer simulations. So I want to leave some time for some questions. Uh, so I've talked about polarization rotation and kind of hopefully gotten that idea across. We've been working lately on these idea of defect dipoles. Uh, when we have random defect dipoles and we really don't see any interesting kind of effect, but when the dipoles get lined up with each other, we see all kinds of interesting effects which come from this kind of bias field that gets imposed inside the material as a function of the aligned uh, dipoles. And uh, so uh, I think that's my last slide. Oh, no. OK, so this work is supported by the Office of Naval Research uh, for many years now. I don't have everybody's picture here, but just people that are working uh, uh, like today uh, or these days, uh, Mukhtar, uh, Hiro, Raja, and uh, Shilu. And forgive me if I leave somebody out. Uh, Raise your hand. Anyway, I think this is who's working on it right now. And um, so uh, anyway, so it's a very exciting uh, time in this area. There's a lot of interest in it, and, uh, and uh, it's practical. So when people ask me what I work on, I tell them I try to understand the core of the earth, and their eyes glaze over. And then I say, I also work on medical ultrasound. And they say, oh, really? That's so interesting. So, uh, so that, you know, at the cocktail table, you know, it turns out that, uh, you know, People have less of, every once in a while somebody says, well, tell me about the core of the earth, you know, but usually they want to hear about, about for electric. So I'll take questions. Thanks. Oh, yeah. So, so you mentioned that uh, you want to get away from the lead. So, so where, where is the future as if we don't use the lead? <laughs> Well, you, the people have made like barium bismuth materials or sodium bismuth materials. So lead is kind of special because it has this uh, lone pair. So so does bismuth. So people have hoped to get bismuth materials that, that, uh, that are as good. But they're not quite as good. But, uh, you know, so, but, you know, they're probably usable. So the thing is there's this huge industry out there too. So, I mean, that's the other thing is that if you're talking about, say, PZT, which is this really cheap stuff, you know, to get them to re-engineer and use a different chemistry, I mean, you know, good, good luck to you know, the bureaucrats, you know. I mean, e even if, you know, it's hard enough when you find a better material, I mean, uh, than the old one to get people to switch, you know, when you've got something well established. But, uh, so, but people are making progress in the lab on finding decent materials, but none of them are as good as these lead-bearing materials. So, you know, I don't know what's going to happen politically. You haven't heard much about that in the U.S. Uh, about, I don't think there's any attempt to ban them in the U.S. But, uh, so, uh, I don't know if they're going to like ban U.S. cars if they have lead containing fuel injectors. It's kind of crazy. But anyway, you know, according to the letter of the law, that would be the case. So the U.S. manufacturers have to worry about it too, you know. Oh, in another area, there's a whole other area of research I didn't even talk about, but just so that you have a complete flavor of everything that's happening. The other really exciting area right now is in so-called multi-ferroics, where you try to couple a magnetic field and an electric field. So you try to like uh, get uh, use a magnetic field to change the polarization, for example. Uh, so in principle, you could have extremely high density memory, like another several orders of magnitude denser memory storage than we have now in magnetic media, for example. So, uh, so and people are working on a new class of semiconductor devices. You know, we, we ran out of, you know, Moore's Law hit a, hit a uh, plat ceiling, you know. So they've come up with uh, materials that are low voltage and, you know, 100 times faster based on ferroelectrics. So, uh, uh, but, you know, again, it's hard, you know, it's hard to get things from the, from the conceptual and laboratory scale out to, you know, it's, I, I can't even imagine when that's going to hit a marketplace, you know. There. So this might be related to the last thing I'm saying, but I know uh, a lot of uh, the colossal magnetoresistant materials are also perovskite. And yes. I guess my question would be: Is is there some 
basic physics? Is it the same basic physics that causes this? No, it's a different physics. Um, so, uh, but you're, you're right, the perovskites are very versatile materials. Yeah. that you also mentioned photovoltaics. Yeah, yeah, I mean, even the high temperature superconductors are related to perovskites, yeah. you know. So, so uh, well, some of, you know, to date. So, so, well, not all of them. I mean, at least that's what started it with the cuprates, you know. But, 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 uh, so yeah, perovskites are pretty amazing, and uh, there's a you know a whole field of you know perovskite research out there, and you could <laughs> forever, you know, never get tired of it, you know. So, uh, but, um, but there are other things to work on, you know, other than perovskites. <laughs> no, I was more wondering whether. Uh, yeah, like I mean, we use the same methods. We use the same methods, points. but you know, they are very sensitive materials, and you can do a lot of different things with them. Steve, so what's so special about perovskites? Ah, what's so special about perovskites? Well, first of all, you can have such a wide range of chemistry, so uh, so you can you know put almost the whole periodic table or and even molecules into the A site, and the whole periodic table into the B site practically, and all kinds of anions on the anion site, you know. So that's one thing, and uh, and then you can mix it up so you can, you know, have you know, complicated system with lots of different elements in it, you know. Uh, so uh, you know, oxides are very interesting in general because oxygen is very polarizable ion, and it's ionic as well as being able to make covalent bonds, and so it's in a nice place there in the perovskite structure. And I guess the A sites and B sites in the perovskite are pretty isolated in some ways, so that you can control things by changing the A site and the B site. And then there's all these different crystalline distortions in perovskite, so they can, you know, the octahedra can rotate this way and that way and so forth, and that changes properties. So there's there's an awful lot of knobs to turn in perovskite. So if you compare that with another sort of uh, piezoelectric material like lithium niobate. So that's very useful, and it's what used to uh, be the tuner in your color TV, and I don't even know if that's true anymore. But anyway, uh, you know, it's a very useful uh, uh, piezoelectric, and that's what they actually used in that piezoelectric fusion study with lithium niobate. But uh, it can't, it's really kind of a vegetable material. I mean, it's only one-dimensional. Polarization can't rotate. There's not much you can do to it. You know, people have tried to dope it with this or that, but it's kind of hard to dope it. And so it's kind of like lithium niobate, you know. So, well, lithium tantalate is similar. So you can make lithium niobate and lithium tantalate, and they behave in a similar way. So, so uh, the other thing is that because the energy scale on the perovskites is very low in general, so that things happen around room temperature. And so, you know, if you have a very interesting material, but it only works above 1,000, you know, C or something, then it doesn't have so many applications in day-to-day -day world, you know. But here, these materials are interesting even at room temperature. So I guess that, that would be, is that a good enough answer? But, but, but the other thing is that people don't look out the box, outside of the box, you know. I mean, going back to the 1950s, you know, people were, you know, looking at perovskites. And so if you're going to work on ferroelectrics or piezoelectrics, you're probably going to work on perovskites. But does that mean that there aren't other useful materials out there? I mean, there are. I mean, the very first ferroelectric that ever was discovered, Rochelle salt, is this immensely complicated material. And it was just discovered by accident or something, you know, in like 19th century science, you know. And, and, uh, and um, you know, so there are other kinds of things out there, and, you know, but they're hard to understand. But now, using theory, you can probably understand them. So there are people that are looking for new sorts of materials outside the box. But I'd say that none of them have really hit pay dirt yet, except for these hybrid perovskites. I mean, they're still perovskites, but they're still taking a big leap because they've got molecules, organic molecules on the A site, you know. So, yeah. When you evaluate these landau devonshire models for uh, the polarization rotation mm -hmm. materials, mm -hmm. is the polarization rotation associated with um, within the theory of second order transition or uh, well, or well, like that. I would say we don't have good enough results yet to answer that. Uh, so, uh, so, so you don't really know about the order. Of no, no, because we're still working through some issues there, especially with the temperature part. So, in those models, you know, typically you just put a temperature coefficient in front of the quadratic term and fit it to something. 
So in our case, we're actually fitting to some experiments just to get things going. But I don't think we're necessarily fitting even to the right experiment there. So, so the temperature part is kind of not well controlled. And we're only doing it one volume. So we can't really say anything about anything except electric field driven stuff. So all I can say there is that we don't see any, so far, we don't see anything that I would really, well, we, can, we can't say anything about the electric field driven phase transitions in any detail yet. But there seem to be there. There are different local minima of different symmetry, even within this model. But I can say we can't say much about them yet. That's one of the things we're trying to understand and map out. But we should be able to, eventually. It seems as though there ought to be critical points nearby yeah. just because you get what looks like the yeah. emergence of yeah. certain properties. Yeah. So yeah. 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 And that's an issue because if our theory is off some, then we, those might be displaced, you know, from the real world, you know, numbers. So that's why we need experiments too. Okay. So, so when you do the simulation with uh, uh, effect and, and uh, our dopings, and uh, I assume you need to increase the size. Of right. That's where the limitation. Yes. Yeah. Is yeah. So the calculations go kind of as n cubed, where n is like the number of atoms in it in the periodic cell. I mean, we have a periodic system that out to infinity, so we're not just looking at a small cluster, but, but it's periodic. So, so when we make a defect, we've got a periodic array of defects, actually. So you have to look at a big enough system size so that those effects don't dominate. And to tell you the truth, we haven't even dealt with that yet, you know, for correcting for that yet. So that's an issue we need to deal with. So, uh, so, um, and again, that's one of the advantage of having the simpler models because those we know exactly what's going on, and so, so uh, you know, they may be not accurate enough, but you know, at least we understand them completely. <laughs> I mean, that's always the trade-off. You, you, in this kind of theory, you have a trade-off between really being able to do things right in a numerical sense and really being able to do things right in a in a physical sense, say, and they're usually not the same thing, you know. Do you have any um, idea what the blocking temperature for diffusion of oxygen ah, is? Ah, so everyone asks that question. So I tell everyone. It's the obvious question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 uh, so, uh, so there's some work on it in the literature that I'm not going to quote right now, but it seems to be fairly high. You know, the one thing that's interesting is that uh, you know annealing at such a low temperature, like 80 degrees C or something can cause this enormous effect. So uh, it's kind of counterintuitive. That means there's actually a very high activation energy for diffusion, because otherwise you wouldn't see any effect with such a small change in temperature, which is the opposite of the way you think about things. But I, I, it's true, believe me. So, so, uh, so it's the high activate. So if you have a very low activation energy, then, then basically a few percent change in temperature is not going to do anything. So you're either. You mean because the oxygens are so mobile? Yeah, yeah. A, yeah, either that or they're frozen, one or the other. Yeah, you get it. But kind if, of it's, transition. if it's uh, a high. Um, well, you need a high activation energy, high but you need a prefactor that's that's soft enough, that or a temp frequency that's high enough, so that you can see things happen. So if you think of an Arrhenius picture, you know it's in the prefactor that's most important here, rather than in the activation energy. So, so anyway, so we haven't done that ourselves. But there is literature work showing that it's very high. Okay? And the other thing I could say is just uh, phenomenologically is that none of this would work if the oxygen vacancies were moving around. So our theory only works if they're frozen, but they're movable. But if they you can know. move a little Yeah, so you can move them over this aging process. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so that's, it's kind of like a, an argument from, uh, you know, otherwise our whole picture is wrong, you know. So, and I can't imagine what is the correct. I'm sure we've got a question back there. So except the lone pair, if it's been laid at them, yes. what other physical phenomena which causes this late pair to be so important? Yeah, okay, well, there's a lot of good answers to that. One of the things, I mean, there could be side effects of this lone pair thing, but one of the things is that the lead itself likes to be off-centered from the center of the A site. 
And so, and many, uh, many people call them like A-site driven ferroelectrics, you know, so that the actual the displacement of the lead is all important. If you look at barium in the same situation, so you compare barium titanate and lead titanate, I mean, this is work that I did in the 1980s, actually. So if you look at barium titanate and lead titanate, the barium doesn't want to move off the site, you know. So in the barium titanate, the ferroelectricity is driven by the fact that the titanium wants to move or really that the oxygen just want to move. But anyway, but in the case of the lead titanate, the lead wants to move. And so, uh, so and it's really this lone tear, pair that makes it move off, you know. And so, uh, since the A and B sites in a perovskite are different, you know, they're topologically different, you know, it, it causes a, a, a huge difference in their behavior, you know, from, from that difference. All right. Um, Ron is not going to be around this afternoon. No. <laughs> sadly. But I have it, a plane to catch. <laughs> but, but he's around uh, quite a bit of the time. So if you have other questions, we'll have a, a, a next week, I think you're going to talk. So we'll have a little bit. So yeah. like this, it's theory week. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, 